So, welcome. I am really happy that you're all here because we can't take that for granted. I guess a lot of you uh, got your ticket on the NDC webpage, you registered and you paid, and then you used the check-in service. Some years ago, a friend of mine was a check-in event administrator. Check-in had just read on their entire web page, and he realized that he could add any other check-in user as an event, an, an event administrator. Not only that, he could also change their details, like their email address. And just imagine if he had found um, the um, NDC account administrator this year and hijacked the user by changing the email address, doing a password reset, and then changing the bank account number for NDC payouts, or deleting all the registered participants. Maybe there wouldn't be any money for NDC. Maybe there wouldn't have been an NDC at all. So luckily, that was reported and fixed. My name is uh, Halvor Saksøg. I'm the application security lead at Forsta. You may not know Forsta. Uh, it's a merger last year uh, of three different companies. One of them is the old Norwegian software company Confirmit. And I've been working there now for 10 years. Uh, previously a developer, now I only work with application security, trying to minimize the number of vulnerabilities. Doing scanning, administering, um, penetration testing, also doing a lot of testing myself. And my favorite thing is broken access control. Because, as you will understand today, it's something that kind of falls through all the cracks. It's very often overlooked, and it's quite fun to find it. So, broken access control, it's pretty much like this picture. Does anyone see what's wrong here? Anyone? Well, this is discrimination against people who can walk stairs but can't climb, of course. I would not try to move a piano past this door. But, of course, like the good people we are, we don't do the climb because this is like a sign really saying no trespassing. But this is actually how a lot of web applications are because we haven't really fixed access control, or we think we have, but then there are these, what if I try this URI? Ooh. There are all these little things that we get wrong. So the real problem, of course, is that the door isn't locked, but nobody bothered checking. So broken access control, does anyone know which position it has in the latest uh, edition of the OWASP Top 10? It's number one. That's where our first SQL injection used to be, and then injection, and now we have broken access control. It's not just one thing, it's actually, if you see this list, it's 34 different things. I'm not gonna cover all of them. I'm gonna focus on what's called IDOR or Insecure Direct Object Reference. It's also called BOLA, Broken Object Level Authorization. These are the same thing, but the latter one is often used for APIs. And someone's tried to kind of move to a different term, but of course, as we know, everyone will just stick with the old one. So it's about like a URI, you have access to a certain resource. You can try to change it, see if you have access to another resource. And a lot of times, you can. So it's about authorization. What's authorization? It's the function of specifying access rights or privileges to users. Jumping down a bit, during operation, the system uses the access control rules to decide whether access requests from authenticated consumers shall be approved or disapproved. That's at least the theory. When I test, I often find that not to be true. Well, it's true a lot of times, but a lot of times also, it's not true. So, speaker tip. Is it a good thing to read from a Wikipedia article? Well, it's better than being sloppy in your definitions. I tried actually to define 
authorization in the previous talk. And once one of the authorities on the subject, Eudo Nyosang, was in the audience and quickly corrected me. <laughs> so get your definitions correct. So let's say you ordered something online, and um, this is the path that you can see in the address line in your browser. Now, are you ever tempted to change it just a little bit? To see if you can see some other orders? Because if you can see other people's orders or whatever resource it is, well, then they can see yours. Then you can see your data. So let's say that same thing with users. Like I see my profile and I see users like 542. It's apparently my ID. Now if I see this, I think, why didn't they use current user? That would be much more sensible because then they wouldn't even need to tell me which user ID I have because I don't need that. So if you want to test in this case, what do you do? Well, the solution is to take this number and take plus one. So that's the entire foundation of this type of testing. The foundation is to take plus one. And I can promise you that if you go plus one in a lot of places, you will likely find something which you sh shouldn't find. I think you get the picture. So a lot of times, it's just about changing a number in the URI. You know what? My five-year-old can do that. Yes, I actually have a five-year-old, and she can do it. But a lot of times, it's of course, it's a bit more complicated. It's not everything that can be changed just in the URI, like API requests often have to have some certain headers that the browser will set. And then you will need a web proxy. Also, if you need to set certain headers or change the verb, a web proxy is pretty much a pit stop for request. You stop it, you change something, you pass it on. And you need one to do a lot of authorization testing. So are you allowed to change a URI? Are you allowed to view the source of a web page? Well, people have been threatened with court cases in both of these um, kind of cases. Um, I don't think anyone has ever been had a ruling against them for changing a URI or viewing the source of a web page. But well, rather test something you're allowed to test, of course. But well, I sometimes do it. But some actual legal advice: if you have done the plus one and you found something interesting, stop there. And you, can, you should also report, if you dare. It's mostly okay these days. What you should not do um, is like test all the other numbers. Don't script it. Don't script it to get all the data. Don't even script it to kind of make an estimate of how long it would take to get all the data. Sometimes the plus one isn't enough. And that's kind of if you see that, well, the plus one, oh, yeah, I think I have permission to that object already. Yeah, then you do like a minus 100 or a plus 1,000, and you, yeah. If you still don't know, then you do one more, but, but you do the minimum. And don't do it on a competitor. <laughs> so I like to speak about security, and I do that at work. It's kind of part of training developers. And of course, the good thing about speaking about security is that my colleagues know that I like to find bugs and vulnerabilities. And um, so one of my colleagues sent me an interesting hack request. That was actually the subject of the email. He had booked a cabin. He said, like, all the good holiday cabins are on this site. It's old, it's terrible, it's probably is vulnerable. Uh, but you had to use it to go get to the good cabins. So he sent me this. Um, I quickly found out that there were num uh, numerous vulnerabilities on this site. So I'm not going to show it because they are still there and we reported it and they just, just didn't understand vulnerability and what that meant and what they should do. So we kind of just gave up, but it's still there. It's bad still. So as you can see, this is the path for the booking contract or the cabin contract which says, has some information about the cabin, naturally. Like, that's public information on the website anyway. 
but of course his contract would say when had he booked the cabin. It also had information about him, his name, his phone number, his email address, uh, did I say home address? Yeah. And also the name and age of everyone who would be going to the cabin. And pets. And what I found was that, well, if I try to take a higher number, I can see other future bookings. If I take a lower number, I can see past bookings. And I, can s I still can. What's interesting about this? Well, it's personal data. There are, in many places in the world, there are laws about leaking personal data. So, and also if he goes there, yeah, also the number of vehicles he had to define in the contract. Um, someone would know that you're not at home and that your guard dog is not at home and they could relieve you of your valuables at home. So there could be real world consequences, so things like this. Another one, parlor, social media, mainly for right-wing and Trump supporters. Um, of course, frequently used in and around the January 6th storming of the Capitol last year. Um, right after this event, let's, do, let's call it that, there were talks about data from parlor being leaked online. And I also remember there were rumors that someone had hacked Parler. And to do so, they had hacked some uh, SMS-based SMS two-factor authentication. No, they had not. Because the Parler posts, they had numeric IDs. So someone just scraped all the data. And if you just accessed all the posts, you could also see the deleted posts. And images and videos had GPS coordinates. Uh, so they claimed that 99% of the data was uh, posted online. Uh, the data was used in the impe second impeachment of Donald Trump. It's likely still being used in courts today. So when we hear about a hack, uh, we often think that oh, it's some really advanced black magic hacking. There are some people, they socially engineered some people, then they chained three different vulnerabilities. Well, if you're user 542, what about user 1? Who's that? <laughs> Typically, the administrator. And what if you can just change the email address of the administrator, do a password reset, and just log in? There is no longer a question of what you can do. The question now is, what can you not do? Because you can do pretty much anything in the system. So I've been a developer, I've been working on systems, and I've seen kind of how things evolve and how we struggle with uh, authorization after a while. But let's say that we have a system. We start with perfect authorization. Of course, in the in this start, the system is simple. So we can actually get perfect authorization. So we have this system, we have like one type of objects, we have one type of users, and we have an administrator, maybe. Adding more objects of the same type, adding more users, doesn't change anything. Because it's not about the number of that type of object. Because that object type has authorization. What happens to our systems is, of course, that we get some change requests to make this useful and to sell more or to retain our customers. We need to do certain things to our systems. So we start to change it. Like group users into like friends or companies or whatever that share something and do not share other things. We create another object type that has some relation to another object type. Maybe if you can see one, you should also have access to the other. So the rules start to get a bit more complicated. More requests, we add another object type with even more advanced um, relations like yeah. And we add another user level. And why do we do this? Well, maybe because the sales department wanted to license more users of a certain type and yeah, figured out the clients would, would spend more with us if we did this. So yeah, we just have to comply with this request. We add another user level and 
they should have access to some objects, so we add another permission system to comply with that. And then what also happens, of course? Mergers and acquisitions. We have two systems from two different companies. Now they need to be one. And we need to make them one in a record time. And we already know that we have trouble with authorization. Now we have big trouble. So this is about the time we just give up. We know we should check stuff, <laughs> but we aren't really. We know that, yeah, it should be better. should be a lot better. So when we start testing it, what happens? So let's say we have two users, Alice and Bob, in this system. Now they're separated, or should be separated from each other, and they need to authenticate to access the system. Alice creates some objects. They're only for her to see. Fine. Bob creates an object, and he wants to share his object with Alice. So she gets the read permission. But it turns out, of course, that when that was implemented, yeah, it didn't really restrict it. it was the code was too complex. So actually, Alice can also update this object. Well, if you look in the UI, there is no option to update, but if you just try, like change the request a bit, yeah, you can. Bob creates some other objects, and these have some other code. What can Alice do with them? Well, Alice can delete the blue object. Why? Well, maybe delete was the last thing we implemented. A at the time, we needed to rush the f the, this new functionality out. We were going to do this later. Yeah. The green object, she can do anything. I'll come back to why. Charlie is also in this system. He is in a different company or a different something, different tenant. Should be totally separate. But Alice can also read or see one of his objects. Why? Well, maybe because support or services needed to see certain objects across different tenants. And yeah, code was complex. Somebody screwed up. Anyone can see this. The green object, what's the problem? It doesn't require authentication. Anyone on the internet can see it, can update it, can delete it. So does this happen? Well, you can go and look at my talk from NDC five years ago. Uh, there was a system I was, had been testing, probably had like 50 or 60,000 Norwegians registered in it. There was no authentication on getting or looking at the user details, which included like phone number, home address, email address, and a few other things. What was even more interesting was that it, the same thing applied to changing password. And it didn't require you to enter the existing password, <laughs> which meant anyone on the internet could hijack any user in the system if they just knew what the request would look like. So to control user access, we set permissions. And we have to remember that when we introduce permissions, we also need to secure the permissioning system. So to set permissions, we typically need to define three things. Which object are we setting the permissions on? Which permission are we setting, of course? And for which user? And all of these have their little interesting properties. If we, can, if we don't uh, restrict which object we can set permissions on, well, then we complicate things just a little bit for people who check for broken access control. Because if I can't access the object directly, maybe I can just assign myself permissions to the object. So like it's just one more step, and then I can go look at that object. What if I, like here, have the read-only permissions, but I can overwrite that permission with another permission? It's called escalation of privilege. Maybe I can be, uh, get the right permission or an ad administrate permission. 
That would be interesting. Or the last one. What if I could take my object and I could add any user to it? Is that a problem? Can't I give permission to anyone? Well, probably I can't in most systems. Like in a social media, you can probably just like add your friends. In a work app, you can probably only add people from your company. And I've seen this a few times, that I can add any user. And of course, the app needs to populate this table with some data from the API. And what I typically see is something like this. Getting the username, the full name, the email address, the company ID, and the company name of other people. Which, of course, could be personal data. So we have GDPR in here. We also learn about our competitors in some cases and how many users they have, which could be interesting. And maybe if we were a hacker, we could um, look up their email addresses, see if we could find leaked passwords online, try to log in as our competitor users. And if that won't work, maybe we just lock them out. Too bad. And what's in your logs? So if you test for broken access control, all the kind of the, from the hacker perspective, all the failures where we are denied access, they might show up in the log. But all the successes, when you actually get to data you shouldn't get to, I think in almost all cases, the logs will just say, yeah, this user got that data. OK. 200 OK. So if you need to find out who accessed what, good luck. So it's a problem. And we need to test to get this right. But testing isn't that easy. So let's say we have one object which has an API endpoint. And this API has supports different verbs, like in this case, six different verbs. Head and options probably don't give much, but they could leak some data, or at least existence of data, which could be interesting in some cases. So just this one object. To test everything there, we will need six tests. And we might have some different user types. And I use the, the, the term user type here. That could mean different things. It could mean permission levels, could mean user levels, or scopes, or whatever applies in different apps. Just like different users, like who are at different levels and should see different things, and like in the same tenant. So we not only have six tests to do, we now have 18 if we have three different user types. And what about users in another company? Should test that as well. So we pretty much double it. We have 36 tests to do. And this object is also exposed with another endpoint with limited functionality. Now we almost have almost 50 tests to do. And that's just for one object. How many objects do you have? Well, it could be a lot. So it's a lot of tests to do. And there is more. Found this on Twitter by uh, someone called Mufadal. A lot of other ideas for uh, IDOR testing. Like, yeah, like here's some of them here. I think we already covered, like changing the verb. You could change the request content type. You could uh, put the ID in an array. Yeah, a lot of different things you could do. This is probably not everything either. There are a lot of other examples. You probably don't need to repeat these for all, like, like all the 48. You don't need to kind of double that or anything. These could be like some more random tests. But still, there's a lot more to test. So that doesn't really work. But how did we get here? I kind of split this out on different functions. Um, and I think it kind of pretty much comes down to we're being too optimistic and people or things are not doing their job. So let's start in the top here with the product manager. I know that product managers are very different in their roles. Some of them write user stories, and they would write things like this. As a user, I want to update my profile so that I can change my information. The happy case. Typically, they don't write 
the opposite. Like as a user, I don't want anyone else to access my profile so that they can see, modify, or delete my information. Has anyone ever seen like a requirement like this? Oh, there are some. Good. Of course, if you make this requirement, you need to have another one like, as an administrator, I need to access everyone's profiles. So it's going to be detailed. But actually, somebody's got to do that job. But very often, it's left for some others to decide. And that's very often the developers. So the developers, they either sit down and discuss this and find some good solutions, or they just start to implement it and make up the rules as they go. And of course, we are good developers, so we write some tests. Tests like user can see, user can update, user can delete, and administrator has full access. The positive cases, happy tests. Yeah, it works. What we need to do is to at least write a few more tests, like unauthenticated is not authorized to prevent like anyone from the internet wreaking havoc in our application. And we could add a lot more, like user in different company can't see, can't modify, can't delete. And how do we do the manual testing as developers? Like, yeah, to check that things work. Yeah, we test with like one user and very often a high privileged user. Test with administrator. Yeah, deploy to production. So, what else do we not do? We don't document. Or maybe we do. Sometimes we do. That would, of course, very be very helpful for the testers, too, to know how the system should work. Also gives the testers some inspiration in what they should test. Uh, but, of course, we know that everything is going to change next week, so yeah, I will we'll write the documentation later. Or the code is the documentation. And the code for authorization is often very complex. The tester. We know what testers do from this joke. A QA engineer walks into a bar, she orders two beers, orders zero beers, orders minus one beers, orders a lizard, orders a null pointer, tries to leave without paying. Satisfied, she declares the bar ready for business. The first customer comes in and asks where the bathroom is. The bar explodes. <laughs> now, as developers, we think that this is really outside the box. We were expecting non-negative numbers, or only positive numbers, not even zero. And can people understand that this should be numeric input? No string input should come here. Oops. Okay, we're back. Um, should not put my hand there. Make mental note to self. Okay, uh, stand there instead. So. As a security tester, I think we need to go a bit further outside the box. And what about changing the unit price to one cent? Or change the currency to Zimbabwe dollars? Or order with another customer ID, maybe someone else will pay for us. Or load the order verification form with another order ID. Maybe there is a pick up your order button there. What about going to slash admin? or send us HTTP 1.0, because we haven't really needed that for the last 15 years or 20 years, or ordering from another origin. There's a lot of things we can do, because if you do that, the problem the bar explodes. So testers are not testing the crazy cases. At least that's my, um, I have what I've learned. Um, and also the testers often lack the knowledge, and they lack the tools. If your testers aren't using a web proxy, they probably don't do any authorization testing at all. Security test tools. Your boss or your boss's boss spent a lot of money on SAST, EAST, DAST, SCA, uh, whatever they're called, because they were told that these will cover uh, OWASP top 10, you will be PCI DSS compliant. But they will never find an IDR. Never. Because they're automated tools, and an IDR needs human 
uh, assistance. You will, will need to tell the system the, what the rules are, or you will need to verify whatever it found. Or, yeah, you'll need to look at it. You can't leave this to fully automated systems. There aren't many available tools, but there are some, and I'll show some of them later. Even have a demo of one of them. So your boss also spent a lot of money on a penetration test to stay secure. They didn't find found they didn't find any idors either. It could be your fault, or it could be the penetration tester's fault. If you set up a web uh, test server for this test, you created a user, you created uh, some data, and gave the credentials to the tester. Then you failed because you made it incredibly hard for the tester to find an idor. What you should do is to create multiple users of different user levels or in different companies or tenants or whatever, like separate. You need to kind of have these separate. They shouldn't see each other's data. And you also need to create some data because then the penetration tester can log in as one user, see what data is available. Log in as another user, see what data is available there. And then try to access across these two users. That's how you simply find idors. Not by guessing, because that's really hard. So if you do that, and even if you explicitly ask the penetration tester to look for broken access control, you're probably still not going to get any idors in the report, because it's so much easier to just fill the report with output from automated tools and from kind of the simple scripts like uh, for them, like log in, log out, like test the authentication, a few other things. I only actually see these in reports from internal security teams. I can't remember ever seeing it in penetration test reports, and I've seen a lot. How did we get here? Now I want to see some hands. Who has had a mandatory application security course during their studies? A few. Okay, next question. Who has been trained in application security by their current or former employer? It's pretty much the same number or proportion when I, as when I train new developers. Final question. Who has been trained at any time on avoiding or detecting authorization vulnerabilities? Good, there are some. Great. So, I thought I was trained. I took this course some years ago by SANS. They're doing security training and certification. So I took this course, Web App Penetration Testing and Ethical Hacking. Learned a lot about a lot of tools, cool ones, automation of different things, like and learned about um, different hacks and vulnerabilities and attacks and exploits and whatnot. They didn't really tell us or teach us about like the, the five-year-old can do this stuff, like the really simple changing, just using a web proxy or just in, in the URI, just changing something. Because it's boring, laborious work. It's tedious. It's much better to just run a tool find stuff. This is boring. You know, you remember all the ca test cases, like the 6, 18, 36? Yeah, maybe you have to run 25 of them to find one either. But that's a f that one could be disastrous, of course. So what should you do? Well, if you're here now with this uneasy feeling that, hmm, do we just like do the path down? <laughs> Have you just given up on authorization? Maybe you should just go back w when you're back at work and uh, just do some testing, just some random testing, because random testing will actually reveal quite a bit of things. If it's kind of the random test fails, there's a lot of things that are li likely broken. And if you know that authorization, we can't do it right anymore because it's just gotten out, uh, out of hand, then start working on convincing someone with influence that we need to invest in fixing this. We can't let this go on 
because it's gonna get go wrong. It's gonna go wrong terribly. So what should a tester do? Well, should start testing. You get a web proxy if you haven't. Start changing requests. So I said there were tools. One of them is a burp suit extension. Burp suit is a um, penetration testing tool or security testing tool. So they have this extension where you can uh, define or you can give it the credentials like, a, like cookies or an authorization header for one user. And you typically choose like a low privileged user. And then you just kind of forget about that user and you start working as another user, like an administrator or a user in a different company. And for every um, request from the browser, like Burp Suit is working as a web proxy, mine in the middle, uh, for every request, it will create two more requests, one for this other user and one for an unauthenticated user. And it will show you kind of which, um, which responses are probably okay and which are like, I don't know, and which are like, yeah, here it's authorization is not enforced. That could, of course, be that it's a public resource as well. So you can do that. There's a license to have the Burp, si Burp Suit Pro, at least. I don't know if this is available in the free version. But if you want free, I have something for you. We have demo time. Um, so I created an extension to Fiddler script. Fiddler is a web proxy. I, I really like Fiddler. Um, and Fiddler is free. So, uh, at least some versions are free. Um, so I'll show something here. We have OWASP Juice Shop. Uh, that's um, something you can download and install yourself. I'm running it on my computer here. It's a vulnerable web application. It has a number of different vulnerabilities. And the good thing is that when we actually find a vulnerability, it will tell us what we found and make it very visual. So first we need some users. So, and I have in this, with this Fiddler script that you can modify if you're not satisfied with it. You can also, there's a configuration file. You can start by har harvesting authentication tokens. So this user here is logged in. I will refresh and I will need to bring Fiddler back up. Because Fiddler found something. Yeah, first it found a request without authentication because some of these requests aren't, uh, aren't authenticated. So I will call this one unauthenticated. Oh, we got another one. So it's asked me what should I call this user. I couldn't increase the size of these messages. Um, so this one, yeah, we're in the incognito window on the browser, so maybe I'll just call it incognito. So now we're har harvested two users. Difference from Burp Suit Authorize is that you can add as many users as you want. So you can actually like, test like eight users at the same time, like in different companies or different user levels. So we're done harvesting. Uh, so we'll turn that off and we'll bring up another browser. So here we have another user. So we'll log in. Okay, we'll, we'll clear the Fiddler log here. We don't need that. But what we'll need is to enable additional authorization requests. So what will happen now is pretty much the same thing as with um, Authorize. Now we can see it in action. So let's see, say we want to buy the apple juice. So we add it to the basket and click this button. Oh, we see the confetti cannon, which means we found a vulnerability. So what happened? It actually says here, you successfully solved the challenge. View basket, view another user's shopping basket. Yeah, and we also had an error handling thing here. We don't need that. So we can look at these colored requests. Uh, okay, we got them in a different order. We'll try to order them differently. There we go. So we add, we add it to the basket. That's the first request. That was the original, like th the request that came from the browsers. This is the one we're comparing with. And we can see that these other requests returned a 401. So they were not authorized. 
to do it. Where they were actually, oh, I would say that should be a 403, but okay. So we had some other requests which weren't duplicated because they were not interesting. Like we don't need to duplicate like a static resource request. You can configure that. Then we have this one. The original one is the body is 257 bytes. This is like a public resource. So this everyone gets the same, but yeah, it's red because, well, it's potentially something. Then we have the next one, the next trio. So the first one is the original request. We get the 200 on viewing basket number seven. The unauthenticated user gets the 401. So that one's green, it's okay. And the, the user, when we take this request and swap the authentication tokens for the incognito user, we see that we can actually see another user's basket, which is what Juice Shop told us. So let's look at this one. We see we have some more colors here. Uh, this, is not, this was just like public information, but it's a bit different for logged in users to non authenticated users, like the, just because if you're not logged in, you can't vote. So let's write a review. Uh, what should you say about the apple juice? Yeah, too sour. Oh, another confetti cannon. Forge review, post a product review as another user or edit any user's existing review. So that's what we did because, well, we suddenly see three different reviews. And as we can see here, these are the review, like posting the review. They all got that to 201. Even the unauthenticated user got that. So maybe we should just, oops, look at it. Oh. Oh, come on. There we go. Let's look at um, the review. So what we sent was the author email address and the message. So if you go back and look at it, that's exactly what's here. So we can actually insert any email address. And yeah, I see, I see problems like this a lot of times. So let's go back to the presentation. So if you want to, uh, if you haven't used Fiddler script, uh, you can look at my um, blog post that I made today. This uh, will also be available in the, uh, in the end. So it's on my Twitter, you can find the link there. Uh, so if you don't haven't used Fiddler before, a Fiddler script, it's really easy. You can just copy the script. If you have like your own custom Fiddler script, there are details there on how you can kind of copy all the script codes that script or parts of the code that you need. Okay, what should you do as a developer? Working with the code. Okay, your code might look like this, hopefully not. Okay, here we have some interesting authorization. So we we're have this get report uh, method. And inside the method, we have a mix of uh, authorization code and some other program logic. But okay, what's what are the rules here? So if the user and the report are in the same company, then you can see the report if you are a viewer or a designer. Or if you're an administrator, you can see it, see anyone any report, regardless of company. And then the next one is kind of looking uh, in the database to see if this user has like some specific permissions for this report. So it's a mix of like different things. And this is often what we like put straight into a method, tangled with all the other code, adding complexity. Of course, another problem here is that like the, the, the method we call and the method we just we are in, have the same name, so it's kind of pretty easy to just skip the authorization altogether. <coughs> uh, okay. Maybe we improve it a bit. We create this in a class or uh, in the library or an endpoint doing the authorization for us, which is very good because then it's reusable and it's also much easier to test it. You can probably do a unit test on it. But we can do better. We can put it in, in an authorization attribute. And the really good thing about an authorization attribute is that you would typically put this like the first thing 
on the back end when you get when you, when when the uh, request is coming in. So you typically have like the another attribute telling you if this is a get or a post or a put or delete, which means you can actually create rules that if it's like one of those, it's like an endpoint where your the requests first come in. You can write rules so that your code will fail if you haven't specified authorization. And you can, of course, specify no authorization if it's a public method. So also, if you have like moved it all out of your code, then you can replace your code completely, like the authorization code. There are some tools for this, or products. Open Policy Agent and OSO. Uh, OSO is like, uh, they call themselves uh, authorization as a service. I haven't tried them. But you can, if you want. What more should a developer do? Should write automated tests? No, don't do that. Write an automated test framework. Some of my colleagues have done this. It's a fantastic project. Uh, and it is not that much code to write, and you can probably reuse it a lot if, if like, your code is similar in many different places. So what they've done is that they have as input uh, a list of endpoints. And they get this from a Swagger or OpenAPI definition. So they know all the endpoints. And uh, then they can test for all the user types. And as I said before, that could be user levels. It could be different permission or permission levels. It could be scopes, depending on how your application is done. You could test all the verbs, even those that aren't defined for that endpoint just to see what happens. OK, so what's the point of this? Well, this system, in our case, creates output. Excel file, it's fairly readable by both man and machine. So we can take this uh, Excel file, which specifies all the different um, endpoints and what can be done there by who. And we can sit down and look at this and say, Is this, does this make sense? Is this how we want the system to work? And maybe it's not, so we can change it. The framework will load this file as the definition. And of course, if we change something, our tests will fail until we fix the code. If we change the code and our, our authorization changes, the tests will fail. If we add another endpoint, the tests will fail. Because, well, it's a help in reminding ourselves that we need to apply authorization on every single endpoint. So, yeah, we solved the problem. We now can test, we can write better code. We can, yeah, not only like test manually, we can test autom with automated tests. But did we solve the problem? Well, I think you got the idea previously that there are some like other cases, and there are actually a lot of them. But the important thing is we need to fix all the simple ones because they are the ones that are easy to find and easy to exploit. So at least we need to ra raise the bar. And then we get used to this, and it's easier to do the others. Because we'll probably come across something like this, like the top one, uh, multiple or, um, things to authorize in the same request, or the bottom one, updating my profile, and I add something which isn't there for me as a regular user, like a role ID, and suddenly I am the administrator. Yeah, so there's a lot of things. But at least was the foundation, maybe an advanced course next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>